In our first video on the Gramus square, we looked at the basic components of the model. In this second video, I want to talk about an example that Gramus gives of how you might actually start to use this heuristic, this square, in analyzing things such as literature, society, culture, myth, and so on. Now, the example that Gramus provides is really drawn from, in a sense, the ideas of the French anthropologist and structuralist Claude Le uh, Lévi-Strauss. Lévi-Strauss talks about kinship structures within society, and Gramus um, provides a number of different squares that work together to illustrate some of the same points. So these three squares are the social model, the economic model, and some individual values as well. As we add terms to these models, what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're providing a kind of investment. Now this is not an economic term, so we're not investing in the stock market or something like this. It's, it's almost more like clothing the, the model, the square, uh, with different things. Okay, so we're gonna add some terms to the square. As we do that, another thing to keep in mind is that Claude Lévi-Strauss makes an important distinction between culture on the one hand, culture on the one hand, and nature on the other hand. So on the left side of our squares, we're going to tend to see terms that have to do with culture uh, that are prescribed, right, that, that we want. We'll put a nice check mark here. And then on the right side, we're going to see things that are often forbidden, and they are seen as natural. Now, of course, as soon as I say that, you might think, well, don't these terms overlap? And in fact, this is one of the difficulties with this model. And Gramus himself recognizes this, because nature, of course, uh, nature itself is a social value. Right? We say that something is natural. Uh, social value. Sorry about that. <laughs> we say that something is natural uh, and as a result it becomes part of culture. This is one of the biggest problems with the Grama square. How, how do we actually keep these terms separate? And as we go on I, I will point out some objections that you might have uh, to this particular way of analyzing culture. Just to expand on this idea of nature a little bit, uh, if you're interested in, in following up on this, I suggest you read something like C.S. Lewis's book, The Abolition of Man, because Lewis really wants to say that there is such a thing as nature, as natural law. Uh, this is very much a Catholic argument as well, that there are laws within nature that are separate from culture. And somebody like Gramus, I think, tends more to the opposite approach, which is to say that uh, anything that we call natural is really kind of artificial. It's something that we have constructed as natural, but that is not natural in some kind of pure sense. Hopefully that, that makes a kind of uh, sense for you. In any case, let's have a look at these different models. So if we start with the social model, we might define C1 here. Okay, C1, and we're just going to use any, uh, we're going to use C as our letter here, but we could use any letter. So C1 is going to be matrimonial relations. And I'm just going to call this marriage for now, make it a little bit easier. So we have C1, and then of course the opposite of that would be non-matrimonial relations. Non-matrimonial. And uh, matrimonial and these relations are not prescribed, whereas marriage is prescribed within the social model. On the right side, on the right side, uh, C2, here we have abnormal relations. Abnormal relations. These are things that are seen as natural, but they are forbidden. Okay, these are things that you should not uh, be doing or be interested in. And then, of course, the opposite of abnormal would be normal. Okay, normal. Uh, and in this case, this, this normal category here, this consists of things that are not forbidden. So they're not necessarily prescribed, but they're still considered normal and they're not forbidden. 
It may help to give give some examples of this. Obviously, marriage itself is already an example, uh, but for abnormal relations, we might say, well, this might be something like incest. Incest is seen as natural, but definitely forbidden. <laughs> um, if we think of the bottom part of the square, in some cultures, we see that adultery is treated uh, in, in different ways. So for instance, if the man commits adultery, okay, so if the man commits adultery, then the culture might say, well, that's normal. Oops, adultery. That's normal. That's what men do. Uh, it's not forbidden and we'll stick it over here. Whereas if the woman forbid, uh, commits adultery, you can see the double standard here. So the woman commits adultery then this is not prescribed, non-matrimonial, and, and the, the culture's judgment is a little harsher towards the woman. Uh, so that's what happens in a lot of different cultures. That's not to say that this is the way it should be necessarily. Right? Gramus actually says that uh, there is no objective content, and it's worth maybe writing this down, there is no objective content so we're not saying that a particular term always has to go in one place. Uh, there's something very artificial, very arbitrary, very contingent about this particular model. And we can change the terms around. I should say, though, that Gramus is not always consistent in this. And, and this maybe shows the, the very culture that he's coming from. So he says, for instance, a term like homosexuality can jump around a bit. Often you're going to find it over here in some cultures. Okay, homosexuality. Though he says it could also appear in other cultures within the normal range, not prescribed necessarily, um, not forbidden, um, but considered normal nevertheless. What he does not suggest is that it could be in the marriage um, part of the equation here. And he basically says that matrimonial relations must always be heterosexual. So that's, that's where you can see how our particular culture actually makes it difficult to be entirely um, unbiased uh, without judgment in terms of how we clothe the square, how we put terms in the square. And we can see that a term like homosexuality over time has kind of migrated uh, in different directions. So in the past, it was often considered abnormal. And then perhaps over time, right, it went over here and became uh, normal. And then later, the moment we are living in, in the, in the West in particular, uh, it has become part of marriage. Uh, homosexual people can get married as well. So we can see that a term like homosexuality has sort of migrated through the square uh, and has been in different positions. But as Gramus says, that should make sense because there's no objective content, so terms can move around. Uh, but at the same time, it shows certain difficulties because if a term doesn't necessarily equate with a particular idea, and the idea here is, of course, what we call a seam, as we talked about in the previous video. This is sort of the, the smallest unit of meaning. If it's very difficult then to correlate a particular example with a seam, with a small unit of meaning, then you can see how the square is going to have particular problems. How do you line these things up? Uh, isn't it the case then that y you uh, you create a square based on your own preconceptions, your own prior assumptions. And the phrase that we use for that is begging the question. Right? Begging the question is what happens when you're really just um, kind of already assuming what the answer to the question is in a sense by um, raising it in a certain certain way. Okay, we spent a lot of time here on the social model, but the point of these different models is actually to start comparing them. So let's move on to the economic model then. And the way the economic model works is that we're going to make a distinction between 
things that are profitable, profitable, and things that are harmful. Okay, kind of messy there, but hopefully you can read that. And then the opposite, of course, would be not harmful. I'm just going to write not harmful, not H, <laughs> and not profitable. Okay, uh, let's give an example again, profit, uh, profitable sexual relationship here, and you can add that in that these are sexual relationships. Um, a profitable one might be one that involves a dowry, let's say. Right? That might be very profitable. Again, though, there, there are difficulties here. Take a term or an idea such as prostitution. Where are you going to put this? Right? Is this profitable? Well, well, if you are profiting from it yourself, making money, you might stick it over here. But if the culture says that these are things that are prescribed and that are, that are positive, then we might actually stick po uh, prostitution in the harmful category. Maybe it costs society money. And notice that we're already starting to line up these different grids because I'm talking about society, the social model, and comparing it to the economic model. And again, there's that, that begging the question problem because we're in a sense already comparing these models before we even create them in order to compare them, right? There's a kind of circularity to this that's really problematic. Um, so where do we stick these terms? We, we already have to assume certain things before we can align these different examples. Okay, so uh, in any case, that's the economic model. The last one here is the, uh, the, the set of individual values that a particular person might have. And P here, uh, think of P as standing for personal. That might be the easiest way to remember this. But as I mentioned before, you can change the letters as you like. Okay, so P1 then is going to stand for desired sexual relationships. Desired sexual relationships. These are the things that I really want, right? Uh, and then on the other hand, we have phobias or fears. These are the things I'm afraid of. I don't really want those. Uh, and then, of course, we have the opposite, uh, and so negative P2 in this case is going to be things that are not feared. I'm not afraid of them. Doesn't mean that I want them, but they're not feared. And over here, these are things that are not desired. Not desired. So we've gone through three different squares, and the question is, what do you do with them uh, in relation to each other? Well, first of all, the squares are very useful once you start comparing them in terms of the kinds of combinations that are possible. So for instance, let's say that we're analyzing a novel and we see a particular character uh, or a particular event, we might say, well, in this case, what we're dealing with, and let's pick a color here, uh, let's make this red for now, uh, where we have a marriage, so we have this, this marriage that, that we're um, analyzing and thinking about, and it turns out to be a very profitable marriage. So what we have here, in a sense, is C1 plus E2, oh, sorry, E1, right? This is the combination that we have here. Uh, but we could think of other combinations as well. So let's give another one here. Uh, maybe pick a different color. All right, let's make this a little more yellow. Uh, let's pick C2 in this case. There's C2. All right, let's jump down a little bit here. C2, and this would be an abnormal relationship, right? So something like incest. Uh, and let's look at the economic model. Maybe we're going to pick negative E2. So E2 in the negative uh, version. Then what we're saying is that this is not harmful. Yes, it's incest, it's, it's natural, uh, not in a good sense, <laughs> but it's not harmful. It doesn't really hurt anybody. And so we have combined these different things. And we can do a whole lot of this, right? We can go through all these different uh, relationships. So the term that Gramus uses for this is that these squares then become a combinatoire, a, a combinatory, as the English translation has it combinatoire. 
Think of it as like a machine almost that spits out different combinations. You stick in different terms and it gives you all these possibilities. But of course, the truth is that not every society allows for every combination. Uh, many societies are going to say, well, these combinations are impossible. You're just not, not going to see them. So as we start to relate the squares to each other then, as analysts, we have to think of different types of connections and combinations. And let's say that we look at our squares and we assign them letters. So think of the whole square now as a letter. For instance, I could call this entire square A, system A, we might say, right? There's system A. And then I might go up and say, well, my square over here, the economic model, this whole square is system B. I'm going to call this B. Then I might say, well, how do A and B relate? So a way to think about this then is that the squares are kind of over top of each other. All right, there's one square, right? And let's draw another square underneath. There we go. Right, so we've got two squares and we've got square A and we've got square B underneath. How do they relate to each other? Well, there are three prim primary ways in which these different terms can relate to each other. The first of, of these is to think of the different sides of the square as relating directly to each other. Okay, so let's say that we have C1 over here and we have P1 over here or we could have E1, doesn't really matter. You can see that they're all in the same position and this relationship is what we call a homology. These are homologies. And by homologies, we really mean things that are similar, right? Uh, similar structures. Mythological criticism often works like this. It looks at different parts of society, different stories even, and it finds examples from very different contexts but that have the same structure, that have the same similar, uh, the, uh, the same idea, uh, the same motif that's being expressed. So those are homologies. And when they occur, we, we say that the two elements are balanced. Okay, so that's the first possibility. And I'm not going to go through all these relationships, but you can figure out the terms yourself. The second type uh, is what we might call um, compatible. Compatible. And the way this works is that if we take any two terms, okay, any two terms from either side, and if you remember from the previous video, this is what we call deixis, okay. Uh, so if we take any two terms, but not terms that are homo homologies, or homologous, we could say, but terms that are non-homologous. So we might take P1, for instance, and negative C2 here. Okay, and we're going to compare those two. So we're going to take P1 and negative C2. Then what we're dealing with is two terms that are on the same side, right? The X is here. Uh, they're not homologous, but they are on the same side, and they're, they're, they're sort of compatible with each other. And then the last type of relationship, the last type of relationship is what we call conflictual. And there are really two types of conflictual relationships. Uh, so the first one is along an axis. An axis is either at the top or the bottom of a square. Right, so if we go back up, this would be one axis uh, and we can put one at the top as well. If it's the top axis, then it's a strong conflict. And if it's the bottom axis, then it's a weak conflict. So to give an example, let's just move all the way up here for a second. If we take a term from our social model and we take marriage, so there's our term, we're gonna take marriage, C1, and then we're gonna take from the other side of the axis in a different model, we're gonna take uh, E2, which is harmful, then we might have a harmful marriage. And you can hear that's conflictual, right? Those two don't tend to go together. That's a strong conflict. Uh, and many societies have a hard time 
dealing with those things. So they, they may be impossibilities. Uh, in, in some societies, we would say, well, a harmful marriage is just not a good thing. It's a strong conflict. Uh, it's not supposed to happen. The other type of conflictual relationship uh, runs along the schema um, angle. So if you remember from the first video, if we have a relationship like this within our square or like that, then we're dealing with a schema, either schema one or schema two. Right, schema one or schema two. Uh, so, for instance, we might take P one, right, from our personal set of values. These are things that I really want: desired sexual relationships. And then I might take negative C one, which would be non-matrimonial relationships. And these things become conflictual. Now, this can get kind of confusing because you look at this and you kind of go, well, that's a lot of letters and a lot of terminology, and is this really useful? I do think it's useful, not necessarily because you, you want to figure out every last combination possible, but it's meant to jumpstart your thinking. It's meant to allow you to kind of look at logical possibilities. And for that, it's very interesting. Now, the last thing I'll mention here is that Gramus notes that the squares don't always line up perfectly. And he's quite candid about this um, in relation to one thing. But I wonder if you cannot extend his, his sort of um, point a little bit further. So what he notes is that if you look at individual values, individual values over here, he notes that schema one, right, which is in this direction, desired sexual relationships and not desired sexual relationships, he notes that these things are often transgressive. Oops, no G there, transgressive. These are things you really want to do, but that society tends to forbid. And that, of course, is an assumption already, this idea that whenever we have desires, they tend to be transgressive and they have to be kind of curtailed and, and um, contained. But in any case, if these are transgressive, then schema one is not going to line up particularly well with our social model because marriage is not about transgression. And so what Gramus suggests is that schema one in this particular model, right, desired sexual relationships and not desired ones, actually tends to correlate with schema two over here. It's this relationship. So my personal desires often tend towards the abnormal, or if they are normal, then they are not ones that are prescribed. Interesting observation. But as mentioned, I wonder if you cannot extend this a little bit further and start asking some questions of the Gramus square. Because if we have to do this kind of transposing and say, well, this schema aligns with that one, then are we really using allowing the square to do the analysis, or are we doing the analysis ourself, ourselves, and the square can be manipulated, it can be altered, it can be changed depending on what we want to see, depending on how we want to relate these different squares to each other. So I think that's maybe a good way to close this video by pointing out that ultimately the Gramus square should be seen as a heuristic, as a help. It's I don't think it's a law, it's not something that's always going to be unchanging or permanent. It's really a way to kind of focus your thought, to focus your analysis. And if you do that, then it will allow you to, for instance, analyze the ideas of Claude Lévi-Strauss. It'll allow you to be a better anthropologist, literary critic, or whatever. Uh, so the Gramus square then, as this example has hopefully shown, uh, can be very useful at analyzing as long as you know the limitations of the square as well.